Hey guys, so this is a video episode of the Reverie Drums podcast. I'm sitting down with Mike Mangiello of Mangiello Cymbals. Uh, Mike is a friend of mine as well as a fellow cymbalsmith, and the, uh, the stuff that he makes is really, really awesome. We talk a little bit about some of the new uh, projects he's got going on, and we talk a ton about cymbal smithing in general. We talk about uh, the art form, what it takes if you want to get started uh, in the art form, and generally just a lot of uh, nerdy symbol talk. So hope you guys enjoy. This is episode three of the Reverie podcast on video. I feel like you really can't hide a, a bad sounding symbol with a self with cell phone audio. Yeah, but with really nice mics, you can actually make a crappy symbol sound good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Maybe not, but that's an extent to that. Like obviously not B8 Sabians or whatever, but um, relatively you can, you can make kind of a garbage sounding symbol sound. Okay. Um, yeah. Whereas if you're just holding your phone above it, I mean, there's really no hiding. <laughs> yeah. All the overtones, all the hums, all the little gongy things are, are all going to come right out, you know? Right. Yeah. It's less, so. yeah. All that, com the compression ends up kind of highlighting those, yeah. those hums more than, disguising them the more high fidelity you get i don't know yeah there's there's audio engineers that could explain why i'm sure but i that's kind of why i do a lot of cell phone audio stuff um because it gives accurate an accurate representation of the sound of your symbols but yeah so uh welcome mangiello symbols <laughs> uh to the reverie podcast and or if you have a podcast and want to use this audio you know, we could, I don't yet. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see. It's a, if I want to add that 8 millionth thing to my right. plate, then exactly. maybe, you know, <laughs> exactly. Then we'll, yeah, that's kind of how I'm, I'm, I'm in the place of trying to get some help so that I can get some of the more lower rung jobs taken care of so that I can do more things like this. Cause I find it to be super valuable. Uh, yeah. I mean, just personally, it's, it's fun to do. It's great to talk to other makers and great to, get different perspectives and different methods and you know, go through all the, all that kind of stuff. But it's also really helpful for people wanting that are interested in knowing more about the, this industry, which is in the midst of kind of, and I don't know if it, you could call it an explosion, but it's definitely a, uh, it's definitely growing. Yeah. You yeah. Know? I, I'd say it's the beginning of an explosion. It hasn't like, like to, to us, it feels like it's exploding because there's more and more of us all the time. Yeah. It's, it's going to, and it's also, I'd say it's more of a renaissance, you know? Yeah. It's way more of a symbol renaissance going on. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, give us a little quick intro to you and yeah, who you are, how you got started, what, what piqued your interest and what, what it was like in the beginning trying to just learn how to do this, this art form. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm Mike Mangiello. I'm a weird guy in a garage in South Philly. Uh, I, um, the, I, I got started uh, the way everybody else does. I'm a drummer and I liked, I like cymbals a lot and I've owned tons and tons of cymbals and would do the like, you know, buy a set of cymbals and then play them for a little while and trade one in and trade another one in. And it was always rotating kind of what was coming out and playing a lot of stuff that was like super inappropriate for what I was doing just because I liked <laughs> nice cymbals. So, you know, yeah. I was playing like, you know, I don't know how many times I tried to get like a high definition ride to work in a, in a punk rock band and yeah. it just, it just nice. wasn't happening. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but yeah, so I, I started doing some research and um, I, I wanted people to make me cymbals. You know, I, I wanted, I wanted handmade cymbals. And custom symbols. So I, uh, I, I got sucked in uh, back in my Facebook days uh, by an ad for Saluda, and I, I bought a bunch of Saluda symbols. And I was like, I was like, man, these are dumb. And uh, and I, so I got rid of those. And uh, sorry, Saluda, Jamie, you're a nice guy. I, you know, <laughs> it's just, but uh, and. Uh, <laughs> Oh, and, man. and then, uh, and then I learned about, uh, you know, I started watching the symbol project, which is, I, I mean, how a lot of people got, got interested in this sort of thing. 
And I, I saw Lance, you know, doing, doing what he does. Lance is not a symbol Smith. <clears throat> Lance has never said he was a symbol Smith. I'm, I'm never, I'm not here to talk shit on Lance. Uh, yeah. I, I think that, I think that he is an extremely valuable, uh, addition to the story. Yeah. And, and, um, and he, uh, he got me really interested in, in stuff. And then I heard about Matt Bettis and Roberto and, you know, Craig Lauritsen and stuff like that. And just like everybody else. And I did like two years of research on the internet uh, where all I was doing was staring at pictures of anvils and staring mm-hmm. at pictures of hammers. Like, what does the curve look like? Why does it look like that? Watching mm-hmm. the Bosphorus video a million times and, you know, everything like that. Um, and then, uh, I bought an angle grinder and a hunk of steel and, uh, my buddy had a little workshop and I went in and like hacked away at it until it started to look like the pictures. And then I, uh, started hammering and he, uh, somebody happened to be moving out of that shop, uh, at that time. So I took that little spot and I went in there and I started working. And I started working a hundred percent in uh, stainless steel uh, because I, I knew where to get it. And I knew it was at the time, I don't know anymore. I haven't made a stainless steel in a minute. Uh, I only make them kind of uh, when somebody requests them now, but uh, they were cheap. Yeah. Like it was cheap. It was cheap to get the material. And I figured if I could teach myself how to shape uh without ruining a bunch of like expensive bronze, then that would be a good idea. Yeah. Um, and I found that I really liked doing it. I really liked doing the uh, steel. I, I think there's a place for it. Um, uh, but so I did that for like a year, uh, just like hammering steel symbols. I didn't have a lathe um, and I had no idea what I was doing. Um, but because of the internet, people are taking a look. I mean, this guy's making, I found that they sounded good when they were really big. So like mm. people are, you know, yeah, uh, interested in what I'm doing because I'm making these like 30 inch, like stainless steel symbols and stuff like yeah. that. And, and, uh, uh, eventually I got some bronze and it was around that time that Francisco kind of reached out and was like, uh, Francisco Domene, mm-hmm. uh, was like, if you have any questions, you know, let me know. And I'm like, I'm not going to bug this guy. And uh, he kept he kept saying, you know, if you need anything, let me know. So I asked him a couple of like technical questions. And I guess they were technical enough to pique his interest because he called me and was like, come to Brazil. Um, so and I know Nikki had had trained with him and uh, Philip. And uh, so I went out there uh, right before the pandemic, I almost didn't get home. Uh, wow. because I, I came home on the 17th of March, 2020, <laughs> oh my uh, God. <laughs> uh, but I spent, I spent about, uh, I think it was like 10 days that I spent out there with him and, yeah. you know, uh, came back and kept working. So that's sort of the background story. And then, yeah, I've been doing it for about three years, um, a little over three years and uh, like, you know, hundreds of symbols in at this point. Uh, yeah. and just doing, doing my thing now. So that's, that's the, that's the origin story, I guess. And, uh, <laughs> I, would you, would you, knowing what you know now, what it would take to get to where you are, would you think that would have dissuaded you from starting at the beginning? No, I don't think so. I mean, yeah. I think, I, I think I might, I might've had to think about it for a minute. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, if, if, if me now went and talked to me, then uh, I, I might have to be like, uh, you got some good points, man. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll do something else. But, uh, yeah, but for, for the most part, no, no, I'm totally obsessed with it. I still, yeah. I still think about it from the minute I wake up until the minute I go to sleep and while I'm sleeping and, you know, while I'm doing anything else, you know? So, yeah, yeah. That, that's, it, it's kind of like, it's a very slow progression, but it really quickly grabs you like the obsession thing really quickly grabs you to where um, it can seem like an impossibility at at first. Like, how do I get my hands on a lathe? Like, how do I build a lathe? How do I, how do I shape a a hunk of steel, you know, Mm -hmm. this, this big into the right shape so that I'm not cracking my symbol on the corner every time I Mm -hmm. have a misstrike. But you just take those little steps and then it goes quicker than you realize and you, and you, 
you, you just figure things out as you go. But once you're a certain amount in, there's really no going back and no kind no. of like deciding you're not going to do it anymore. <laughs> no. it, it really does grab you. Yeah. I find that people that are really serious about it, it's you're just done once. Yeah. Once you're in, you're done. Yeah. And that's why I sort of warn people. It's, it's less about like, you know, when people, cause I, I'm sure you get emails all the time now too, that, you know, like, how do I get yeah. started or, you know, mm-hmm. all that sort of thing. And, you know, I've been getting those since I had no idea what I was doing. And I'm yeah. like, I don't know. I don't know why you're asking me, but you know, uh, but now I get them and, and I, I'm just like, I have a couple thoughts on it, but, uh, and it'll tie into probably some stuff that we'll talk about later about where, where we all think this is all going. Yeah. But, but, um, you know, I just warn people, I'm like, this isn't like a, this yeah. isn't like a, I, I want to make a knife once, or I want to like, right. you know, make a wicker basket or whatever it is that you, that you're interested in trying out, you know, it's, yeah. This is like a really, really serious amount of, of work. And it's also incredibly expensive and yeah. time and time consuming, you know. Right. Like I spent I spent uh there's there's like six thousand dollars worth of bronze in my living room over here right now. You know what I mean? <laughs> yep. And yep. it's like <laughs> Yeah, well, right over here for me. Right over yeah. there for me. And you know what? Some of it isn't gonna work. Some of it is yeah. gonna get like so I mean, like I haven't broken a symbol in a while. Yeah. But like, yeah. but like it could happen. And like, some of these could suck. I don't know. Yeah. Like some of these could not be good enough for consumption t- to me. Right. You know, and they might sit on a rack and I keep them all because there's a symbol for every drummer. So somebody will come and like that one. I have one symbol. It's been in my shop for a year and a half. It, I hate it, but yeah. everybody that plays it likes it. Uh, it can't be that good because nobody's bought it yet, but but one but, day, right? Yeah. But you know what I mean? Like somebody's going to buy that one and like, you know, so I keep them all. But um, and in any case, going back to that is, is like, I think that with the explosion thing, you know, where, where it's going, I think that uh, there's going to be people who, who do it on a, a very high level. Uh, Dave, you know, Nikki, uh, you know, hopefully you and I, that mm-hmm. sort of thing. And, uh, uh, and then there's going to be hobby guys. You know what yeah. I mean? Uh, right. there's going to be people who have lathes that are inappropriate or small or, or, you know, underpowered or whatever. They just have something that'll do the job and, uh, you know, they've got their little, in their little garage or something at home or their basement. And that's, you know, they'll, they'll have do a couple symbols and put them up on Instagram or, or won't, or whatever. They'll just do it because they want to. And uh, I think there's going to be people like that. Um, and then I think there's going to be, um, uh, I, I get skeptical, uh, of anybody new for a minute. Yeah. Uh, just because there's people that do this and then there's content creators. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, like oh, yeah. people, people who just want to say, Oh, look, I, I make symbols and, and, uh, the, it, the quality is not there or the, or the, 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 obviously the understanding of it is not there. So, yeah, you uh, said it on a, on a post recently, you said something about how the, I was, you were at doing the, ask me a question thing on Instagram and someone asked you about getting into it and you said uh, the community is skeptical until you prove you're serious. And that, I, that really resonated with me. That, that, that is true. Like you, you there is a, a sense of like, are you just kind of a, not a charlatan, but are you kind of getting into it so that you can leverage that to have a, con- a like you said, a content creation platform yeah. and have a bunch of subs. Um, or are you like here for the art of it? And really invested in, yeah, the art form, which is like, it's just like music in that way where it's, you, you can't ever, I don't really think you could ever master this in the pure sense of the word. Right. But, but just like you can't really master music because <clears throat> there's always sure. techniques and methods and um, yeah, but and th- I, that I liked, I liked you, what you said about that. And um, I think that's totally true about this industry. Yeah. Yeah, because it isn't. I mean, it's an industry. We're we're part of an industry, but the part of the industry that we are, we are a community. It yeah. is a small community of people, yeah. and I think it's becoming more of a community. I think the more and more we let our our guard down and our ego down a little bit, mm-hmm. because I mean, you can't do this stuff if you don't have an ego. It's um, it's just it's just the way to like. There's no way that you can do this if you can't sit there and say like, I'm totally going to do this weird thing. Yeah, you know, like right. like if you can put that away a little bit and just 
accept everybody and accept accept what it really is, which is a lot less, yeah, uh, you know, amazingly fantastic than than we all want it to be. Right. Then then I think we all have a chance to do to do something really interesting because you know we already we already took a big bite out of the big guys. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's we're true. here. We're not going anywhere. You know. Right. And then so. especially uh, the the big uh, the most recent. Uh, the most recent thing that's happened that that has that has me thinking like it's really starting to become a thing is Paul Francis starting yep. as an independent maker, uh, yep. which if you don't know Paul, if, if people out there listening don't know, Paul Francis uh, was at Zildjian for over 30, 35 years, maybe. Yeah, something like uh, that. As like their main product developer. Uh, and he started out when he was 18 on the on the lathe at the Zildjian factory and worked his way up. And mm-hmm. um, he's now out doing the, doing the independent thing, which yeah. he, uh, he's also an incredibly gracious guy to it. Uh, really nice guy. Yeah. Chatted with him a few yeah. times, but um, that, and his, especially his connections in the industry, you know, people notice when that happened, I think it's also just kind of shining light on the, how it's possible to do this. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I my, the way I started was by modifying symbols. Cause I had buddies. I first started at, by having a grinder, and cutting up cracked symbols to make weird accessories. And mm-hmm. then I would get symbols in that would have like a little one inch edge crack. And I'd be like, man, this is a nice, this is a expensive symbol that has just a little crack. I could just like scoop the crack out and then it's a symbol again. So that kind of was the first step in me then going, okay, well, what if I smacked it with a hammer a couple of times? And then what yeah. if I smacked it a few hundred times? What if I, you know, all the, all the different kinds of things. And that, that kind of led me to starting like a modification service. I had a lathe and was doing that. And I, I had told myself I wasn't going to make originals. I was like, I'm just going to be the modification modification guy. Um, and then I was like, well, I'll just get, I'll just purchase a couple of blanks and just do it so I can say that I've done it. And mm-hmm. it'll probably help me in my modification technique. Sure. And, and this, the first symbol I did it in one day, and by the end of it, I hit it and I was like, holy crap, that's a symbol. Yeah. And that's a better sounding symbol than a lot of the ones I played that cost a lot of money. And this is mm-hmm. and at, from the onset, I was just like, this is, this is what I'm doing for oh, as yeah. long as I can swear. For, for the rest of your life. That's a, yeah. that's a, yeah, that was a, as soon as I, 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 I was in my basement with an unshaped piece of metal that was the anvil yeah. and I, I, an, un, an unshaped ball peen hammer and a, and a like a scimitar. Yeah, yeah. And I, I I hit it and I I hit it a couple times and destroyed it. And I didn't care. I was just like, yeah, I'm doing this forever. This is yeah, it. I'm yeah. just that. I'm just doing yeah. this. Yeah. And it, so. and part of that, uh, I I think that part of the reason why we have that kind of experience is because we I think symbols are so mystifying to people. I think that people think they know what they like and what they want, but I think most people don't. And that's not me trying to insult no. anyone because I, I went to music school and I practiced eight hours a day and did the crazy, like, I'm going to be the best drummer I can possibly be and move to New York City and do all that. Right. I did all of that. And throughout my whole process of doing that, I bought and sold you know, 50 to 100 symbols over the course of a few years in college. And I didn't know jack squat about symbols and how to how to choose a symbol to get the kind of sound I was looking for the kind of sound I had in my head uh, and it wasn't until I started modifying and I modified you know hundreds and hundreds of symbols and I saw every brand every different model and then started making them and and over the course it's like this slow realization has kind of bloomed about you know just about symbols themselves like I'm, I'm finally getting a baseline understanding of this instrument mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's, it's incredibly exciting. And then you, you kind of realize that like, oh, you can actually craft the sound you want and you can help other people achieve the sound they want, you know, knowing that, knowing what it's like to be the person that want, that buys and sells symbols all the time, wants that sound, but doesn't quite know how to achieve it or, right. um, it's, I, I think the idea of like demystifying the art form, that's kind of the reason why I want to talk to uh, symbol smiths on this podcast is like the idea of demystifying this instrument. Yeah. Giving people this realization that there isn't a, 
Uh, there isn't a Holy Grail symbol, doesn't exist. Uh, and symbols are inc- wildly different depending on where you play them and how you yeah. play them and what sticks mm-hmm. you use and what is the surface like, surfaces like in the room you're in. Yeah. All of that is going to change. You might love a symbol in one room and hate it in another. Yep. Uh, and so that kind of thing, being able to talk to people like yourself, I, I think it could hopefully help people get – uh, an idea that it's a tool and you collect tools to have in your arsenal. And if you take an artistic approach of it, you might think like, well, I want, you know, I'm, I'm looking for this kind of sound. And I think that Timothy Roberts symbols has that kind of sound, but right. I also need this sound that will do this other thing. And so I need a Mangiello to do that. And you right. can kind of take this like brand uh, obsession where, where people are like so brand loyalty obsession that people have yeah. over like, I only play Sabian. I only play Zildjian and kind of just bust that loose a little bit and go, you know, all the independent makers have their own unique thing they bring to the table. Yeah. And you can kind of co- collect and you can create, you know, collect colors for your palette. Mm-hmm. And then when, you know, depending on the kind of gig, you can go, well, you know, my, my Nikki moon is the one I want to bring to this gig. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, all that to say, like, uh, I did have a question. Like, if you if you could make people under understand one thing about the process of purchasing a symbol through an independent maker, what would that be? And that could, you could go any any route you want to go with that. But maybe like tackle a misconception that that the customer has when they're coming to you asking for a sound. Like, what do you wish people understood about this process? That's a re- that's a really good question, uh, <laughs> uh, and and we could probably do a separate podcast about right. that. Right, just about. But, that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. but uh, I guess the the first thing that comes to my uh, the, the thing that I wish people I wish that people would understand that uh, that we're that we're not making factory symbols. I think that, I think that people think the process is going to be very quick. Um, and, and it's not like, unless you're buying something that's already made, uh, mm-hmm. like for like a, like an already made symbol, which all of us try to have those up on our websites most of the yeah. time. But, uh, but if you're ordering a custom symbol or in the case of Nikki and, and in, in my case, very soon, if you're ordering a production model, I still have to make it, yeah. you know? So you're looking at like six weeks because, uh, you know, they have to be made in, in Turkey and sent to me and I have to make them and make sure they're good and, you know, blah, 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 and then ship them to you. So like, it's, you know, it's a long process. Um, I think that the number one thing that I wish people didn't do (laughs) was, was ask me to make a symbol that exists already, um, which, which happens all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you should be like, I really like this. I'm just, I'm just going to pull a name out of a hat. This is not, I don't know, but let's just say, I really like the Meinl Byzance, uh, traditional medium ride. Let's just say that's the one. Yeah. Uh, I really, really like that symbol. Can you make a symbol just like that? <laughs> and, I, and, and my answer, I, I turn away a fair amount of business, uh, yeah. because I, I, I will literally just say to them, buy that symbol. Yeah. Yeah. Go, they are available. Yeah. The symbol that you asked me for, I think it was yeah. like uh, somebody a couple of weeks ago asked, you know, those Zildjian fat hats that just came out. Mm-hmm. Uh, somebody was like, I really dig this sound. It's really speaking to me. You know, can you make symbols like that? And I'm like, go buy one. Yeah. Go. You're not yeah. going to be happy with the one I make you because yeah. no matter what, the, the yeah. sound that you see on the video, you're probably not even going to like the ones that you actually get from Zildjian. Right. Yeah. Because you are obsessed with the sound that's in that video. You the like EQ that sound. And pr- compression they used in yeah. that video. Yep. Yeah. So if you, if you want a feel, if you want an idea, if you have, like, like I was so happy. Uh, I just finished up a set for a guy that wanted symbols to sound like the ocean. And, <laughs> and that, I was into that. Yeah. I was like, yes, that yeah. is what, that's what we're talking about. And he was happy. Yeah, you know, I was like, I was like, yeah, I could totally do that. I didn't even say, I didn't even think about it for two seconds. I was like, yes, I can absolutely do that. Like, see, that's that's a key here for anyone listening. Like, 
I I feel like if you go to because any of us independent makers, uh, we're we're all artists, and so you know we're all we all have very fragile fragile egos and strong egos, and we're very particular and all these things. If you if you come to us and you say, can you make something like you said something abstract? Can you make it sound like the wind on a winter night? That's gonna be like that's gonna speak right to that's like a challenge that, that touches right on the artistic side of what we're Mm -hmm. doing. Or if you say like, I play this kind of music and I want the symbol you would like to play. If you played that kind of music, what would make me something that you would love. There's something about that, that touches on, I don't know. it, It actually helps us tap into the, the artistic side of what we do and the passion side of what we do. Whereas if you come and you just say, Hey, I like the AA sick hats. Can you make me some AA sick hats replicas, you know, from Sabian? Um, it's going to be like, it's going to, there's not going to be the, as much creative energy in that. Obviously like we're professionals. So we're going to make them well, if we choose to even make them, you know? Right. Um, but that, that idea of kind of just giving free reign, but putting loose boundaries on it actually can, yeah. can re- almost always results in a better end result, you know, for me, yeah. when I, when I put less parameters around a new symbol, kind of let the blank tell me what it wants to be and kind of go for it or, or even like make a symbol and have a crazy idea of like, well, I, what if I took it this direction and, and then just go with it. And then also it becomes a completely yeah. different sound than I was originally intending. That's where you can find those little, you know, every now and then those magic, those magic symbols yeah. can, come, can be produced that way. Yeah, and I'm I'm hoping that I uh, that I can still do stuff like that because I I that's my favorite way to make a symbol is to just make it. Yeah, and that's I'm not thinking about it. I'm just making a symbol, and when it's done, it'll let me know it's done. You know, yeah. uh, I I don't care how high the profile is. I don't care how flat the profile is. I don't yeah. care that the bell hole is over here. I don't care that there's a bump on the edge from where they clamped it. You know, yeah. I don't care. I don't care that it's 21.75 inches. I don't, I don't yeah. give a shit what it weighs. I don't care what it looks like. It's just, it is, it is what it was meant to be. Yeah. Uh, and I'm still going to do stuff like that, but I've also, what is a, a very interesting challenge and something that I've been working on for months is making repeatable symbols yeah. that aren't boring that that are that are actually still artistic and still yeah and and it was a lot less about i found that it was a lot less about um uh you know like i need to hit it this way or whatever to make it like this it was more like capturing a the a feeling every time yeah capturing I, you know just being like okay this energy is what i put into this one and i'm going to bring that to everyone from that series or whatever. Is that a strictly, uh, would, would you say that's mostly the challenge aspect of it that excites you? Or is that also just a business practice? Cause, because the one-off one of a kind thing is much more time consuming taxing to do customizations. Like it's, there's always like a, a tendency that if you can systematize things, it, it makes it much more streamlined for your company. It, it does, but I would, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't. Mm. Uh, like the, the series thing is de- definitely making the choice to do the series thing was two things. It was, it's one, I wanted to do the, cha- I wanted to challenge myself. Like, like, could I do it? Like, yeah. could I, could I make repeatable series, you know? Yeah. Uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, you know, you can do it. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, lots of, lots of companies and people have done it, but, uh, it's good to see that I can. But it was also obviously to make it easier for my customers and for yeah. me. Um, there will always be the like you can order a custom thing or you know that sort of thing or or even if you like this series but you kind of want it different than than it is on the website. Yes, I can do that. You know that's what's great about ordering something from somebody like you or I. You know, yeah, it's more of a, a like Nikki calls calls them more like templates. You know, like yeah. it's like this is the series. But I, I'm a, I'm the guy making it. So if you need yeah. something else, you know. Yeah. Um. Uh. I, I. It's a certain amount of pressure. It's weird because because I ha- I had to do, I had to sit down and preconceive 
what weights all the blanks had to be at for each series, in yeah. each model, in each size. And like, I had to, I had to, you know, prototype all of them and everything like that. And I mean, it could be, that's why, that's why I didn't do series for a while because I, I, there's a lot of guys that start doing this and then just put up a symbol and say, this is a series. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry, guys. I'm saying this to the independent guys that are just starting out. If you make a symbol and you put it up on the internet and you say that's a series, it is not a series. That is not a series. Yep. Yeah. You cannot, you cannot do that. It really pisses me off because, <laughs> because if you're just going to put that finish on, on a bunch of symbols and say it's a series, you are incorrect. Yeah. I, that's why it has taken me months and months to do this yep. because I, at the end of the day, I'm going to have an example of every base model in every series. And I'm yeah. going to show it to you and say, yeah, here is every symbol. Like I see. Here, yeah. You know, I see like, what you're saying. If, yeah. I, if I was going to, that's why it's a challenge. That's why it's a challenge for me. It's not a challenge. Like I could easily tomorrow just be like, this is the workhorse series. Here it is. Yeah. And I'd be done. Yeah. But I, there are, there are 52 symbol blanks 10 feet away from me and I'm going to make every single one of them. Yeah. And then I'm going to go to a studio and I've got a bunch of drummers coming. We're going to demo everything and have an actual series release, you know, like that's a series. Like Nikki did it right. Nikki did the one series and, you know, mm-hmm. he's got a couple other series. They're all great. But like the one series is a, is a cohesive collection of symbols that are repeatable, artistic, interesting. And, uh, you know, I really like that, you know, so uh, I'm not doing the same thing, but it's, but that's the idea is to actually release an entire collection of symbols and say, I can make that again and again and again, you know? Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Do you, do you, uh, do you communicate the slight di- variances that come within it? Or are you, are you looking like as accurately as possible, get the same sound, a very similar weight range? Cause obviously that's what they do at the big manufacturers is they have a right. master, and they'll create, they'll, they'll produce the symbols and then they'll literally put it up next to the master. And if it's within a certain right. range, it'll classify as an A right. custom crash or whatever. Nope. No, I do everything by eye. Uh, I like the profiles will all be slightly different. Everything. Yeah. Will be, yeah. It's a, it's a feeling, you know, yeah. like the, for, for example, the workhorse series is just, it's a traditional series in that it's a fully lathed. Yeah. Symbol. Um, but there's enough options for anybody who wants to play jazz or rock or metal or whatever you want to do, depending on what weight or bell that you're looking at. Yeah. Um, but it's a feeling. The feeling is, is getting like warmth, lots of usable mid range, good stick. And, and there's a, there's a, a certain, uh, sort of like semi complexity that comes from being a handmade instrument. And the, the only way to do it is like, I, I've made a few of them and said, okay, I can get that feeling over and over again. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, and then, I, I mean, a lot of it has to do with the laving. A lot of it has to do with how you, how you taper them. You know, e- you know, I, each thing is tapered a certain way. The lathe grooves are a certain way. And that really adds the characters that you're looking for, you know? Yeah. Uh, same thing with the other series. Like it's like, it, it has a silvery thing going on and it's because the profiles are very low and it's tapered a certain way on the bottom and it's mostly raw on the top and, you know, that sort of thing. And get, you know, those attitudes are going to come through, especially right. if the same person is making them over and over again, you're going to get that feeling every time. You know? Yeah. It, it, especially if you have the experience to, to back it up and, and do right. it. You know, I'm, I'm not, you know, the most amazing simple Smith in the world, but I, I can repeat the feeling, you yeah. know, even if I don't hammer them the same way every time. Right. And yeah. the, the truth of the matter is, is even at, God, I would actually hesitate. I, I would say, especially at big, bigger manufacturers that do the handmade Turkish style stuff, mm-hmm. those are, uh, those are wildly different from symbol to symbol. Mm-hmm. To where almost you, you kind of don't even get the same vibe from some of them. There's, there's so, sure. there's so, and, and, and that, be, that comes from the fact that, and this is the real difference I find with an independent maker versus big manufacturer 
is that big manufacturer has quotas. They're pumping out hundreds, if not thousands of symbols in a day. Yeah. And so they cannot, they, financially, it's, they're not able to spend the time right. with each piece to make sure it, it sounds its best, you know, given, you know, within the parameters. So they're, they're kind of copying and pasting a template onto each bronze sure. and then sending it out. And then, you know, the reason why I modify so many is because people will buy the symbol they thought was their dream symbol. And it's just, it's just got weird tones. It's like tons of hum and it's just unfocused and, and I'll get those symbols. And oftentimes they're like, you know, six, $650 rides. And I just put it on the floor of my shop, kind of press up near the bell and the whole thing wants to invert, but the edge is super strong. And it's like, well, there's, there's part of your problem for that unfocused thing is like, it's, they just quickly kind of like hammered it out and then sent it on. So even at the major, major manufacturers, the idea of getting the same symbol, it's always going to be different, but, yeah. uh, you know, it, with the an, an independent maker, the whole the whole thing we do is we spend a lot of time with each piece, yeah, ensuring that it's going to hit the quality level we want before it actually goes out the door. You know, yeah, and and people aren't. I mean, that's another thing people aren't aware of. You know, I mean, like if you have a Turkish manufacturer that's hand making symbols, like ten people touched that symbol before it was done. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, who was working on Tuesday? Did, right. did, you, did you get Larry's symbol or did you get Bob's? You know, it's like, like <laughs> yeah. who was, who was working that day? Yeah. And like, did they, were they just trying to get to their lunch break or like, you know, right. these guys, they just want to get their, their clock it in and clock it out. You know, the masters there. Yeah. They're, they're, they're very serious about everything like that, but they got a bunch of dudes that are just right doing a job, man. And yeah. you know, so that also lends to like inconsistencies. You know, yeah. where they've all got different hammers. They've all got different strokes. You know, I mean, like if you had, if you took one of those guys that knew how to do the process from start to finish, which none of them do except for the masters, yeah. uh, like, but let's say you did, then you would have consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that once, once one of the independent guys gets good enough that he, he or she, they use, can, can do the process from start to finish consistently then then you can do repeatable stuff without having to worry so much about it being inconsistent. You know, the inconsistencies yeah. will be there because it's a handmade instrument. Right. You know, especially if you're like me, I, I'll obsess for for hours and hours and months and years. And then when I go to make symbols, I I just do it. Like I'm yeah. I'm not sitting there, you know, I'll, I'll look and make sure it's flat and you know things like that. But like I I there's there's some things I just don't care about. Yeah. You know, and you know, at the end of the day, it just has to sound good to me. It has to feel good to me. And then I can let it go. Yeah. So, so uh, and, so, and selfishly, most of it for me is just about making the symbol. Mm. I, the end result is almost less important than that. I get to make the symbol. The process. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's art. Yeah. Like I don't, I, I, I just want them to go away once, once they're yeah. done. Yeah. You know? <laughs> oh, like get them out of my shop as quickly as yeah. possible. I, mine is a little different. Cause I, I really, I, I like playing my symbols on my gigs and I've, mm -hmm. I've actually created a couple gigs locally in town. Just not just <laughs> so that I can play my symbols, but almost so that I can like try out all the new symbols I'm making yeah. week to week. Um, and that kind of perspective ends up helping me a lot when it comes to knowing when a symbol is finished. Uh, Cause there are times where like, I mean, we, any new symbol Smith is going to have like the biggest thing you have to figure out is when do you decide that it's done? Because mm -hmm. there is not, no voice is going to come out of the heavens and say, okay, it's finished now. Like you, you right. could, I've taken, I, I say this to my wife all the time. I took that symbol a little bit farther than I should have today. Or, yeah. or and I, it used to happen a lot more in the beginning where it was just, I would get to a point where it was really nice sounding. I was like, that's a great sounding symbol. But what if I just did, and then the second I you go that route, one thing becomes 10 things and all of a sudden, okay, I missed the mark on this one or I had to just mm -hmm. change my intention for it. Now it's a super tall profile, trashy, kind of hissy old K kind of thing where I was wanting it to be like even spread and nice crashable, whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. um, 
so yeah, that, that kind of thing is fun. I, I, my, I kind of struggle with the whole idea of series and I, I feel like my, my, I'm, I'm kind of trying to dip my toe into it without going like as far as you're going to where it's like a, my series are vibes. And if you want the vibe, it's a part of this. And I don't know if there's a different name for it. It's like a model or whatever. So like I started out with like trying to make a Bill Stewart esque symbol. Yeah. I remember. And yeah. I, and I just took the dry complex idea of like the unlathed band around the edge on the underside. And was like, okay, I'll just see what this does. And so I created a couple of them and I was like, Oh, that's cool. And I, I liked what I was getting. And so I made another like 50 of them. And after at that point, I feel like once I had made 50 of them, it became a series of like, okay, the labyrinth is this vibe of complexity and, you know, a little bit grittier, a little bit angrier, um, a little bit less sustain, more drier on the stick. Um, but yeah, the, the idea of just like making one and then it goes up and it's like, this is the series. You kind of have to see what the range is mm-hmm. for like a, a, a symbol idea. Like what's the range of sounds that can be contained within it. Right. So that you can Where, actually what? boundary off the, the edges, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like what are hats going to be like? What are, what is a flat ride going to be like? What is a crash right. going to be like? You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Totally. So. Uh, so let's get, maybe get real nerdy for a second. I, I've been, oh, please. Yes. <laughs> I, I don't know. How, we might start losing people at this point as we get like really deep into it. But <laughs> uh, te- the, the idea of tension and uh, tension distribution in a piece of metal What's your philosophy or what is your, what kind of thoughts do you think about when that, that topic comes up? Um, well, I mean, that's a comp that's complicated, but I, I think that, I mean, essentially what we're doing, I mean, you're squeezing a piece of metal up against another piece of metal with a third piece of metal. And, you know, you're, 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 it, it's cold impact hardening. So, so, you know, tension is a tension is not, it, it's such a weird word to use for it because it, it will tighten that spot on the top or the bottom, you know? Uh, and, you know, depending on what you're doing, working on the top or the bottom can loosen or tighten, loosen or tighten the, the piece. And, you know, uh, you can start on the top, you can start on the bottom, you know, but does the symbol know that you started on the top? What is the top? You know, I mean, like if you do a certain traditional way, you're starting from the top and then, so you're adding tension and then stretching from the bottom and then adding tension. But yeah. what if you started from the bottom? Is that adding tension and then stretching from the top or what, you know, and did you invert it? Did you not invert it? You know, uh, if you're hammering from the bottom, but it's inverted, it's weird because all of a sudden the symbol is doing this instead of doing that. And, you know, so tension is a weird way to look at it. How would you classify it other than not using the word tension? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, really, uh, most of the time what I do is you're just, you're just, the reason to call it tension is because you're balancing the tension of the overall symbol between the top and bottom surfaces. So yeah. that's the easiest way to, to look at it. And Think then, about it. and then deciding like how loose or tight you want the, the structure of the symbol to be. Um, and so I guess that's the way to look at tension. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't really think about it that way anymore. Uh, I, I just kind of like, I start on what side that I want to start on, depending on what it is that I want to do um, or what mood I'm in or what, how I'm feeling. And then I try to get it to sit flat. And a a lot of times it's not even through hammering anymore. I do a lot of that stuff on the lathe. I I do a lot of that stuff by like literally just bending the shit out of the symbol, uh, you know, in an inverted way and then flipping it back. And then it sits on the, sits on a table flat, you know, like it's, it's not all about hammering. It's, it's just about like manipulating the metal. Um, so. so there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of different ways. Like hammering is not the only way to shape or tension. And uh, 
yeah, the lathe is almost as vital to the shaping uh, process as oh, if, not, if not more so um, just to get certain sounds. I mean, um, like if you could, if you had a machine powerful enough that you could do like pressure lathing on a heavy blank, you wouldn't need hammering at all. Yeah. But, but yeah. none of us, none of us have that machine. Right. Right. Uh, so you have to hammer it first before, you know, yeah. if you have a really, really thin piece of metal, you know, you, you can, you can shape it on a lathe, you know, yeah. it's just, it's going to give you a certain vibe, you know, it's not going to give right. you the same vibe as hammering wood. And of course, you know, thinner material is going to give you a, a certain vibe than heavier material, you know, man, so. I, I've been in a zone of, uh, cause I'm trying to make a lot of symbols that, that utilize the crust, the unlathed crust as a way to dry it out mm -hmm. uh, and get, given that I'm aiming for lower target weights. So it's like, I, I'm kind of needing, I'm needing a little bit more dryness because those thin weight symbols can sound very tinny and kind of just um, non-existent on the stick. And uh, the other day I'd just gone through like probably 10 or 15 I'd made that were started out fairly thin blanks. And then the other day I pulled out a heavy blank and I made it in an eighth of the time. Like I, oh, I yeah. initially shaped the thing in like an eighth of the time. And I was like, oh my God, what am I doing? I, I, I when I started, I just ordered really thin blanks because I was Everybody like, Everybody does. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it actually, I think it was good because it just kind of threw me in, into the fire a little bit of, of really this, you got to learn how to like really balance this tension because this thing is not going to behave. Like you're going to hammer right. it you're going to get these little waves and you're going to hammer the waves and then it's going to pop up on the other side of the symbol. Huh? And you're going to go, what the heck? And so you learning how to like balance things and learning how to not address certain problems, knowing that they will be addressed throughout the whole process or mm -hmm. not dealing directly with a problem area, but going somewhere else to address yeah. the problem area. Um, but then you can just get like a real, you've told, you've told me about this where you you've gotten like a, a ride at like over 4,000 grams to start on. You could just get it shaped in like 20 minutes or something, get an initial shape. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is like, and the, you know, for anybody who's listening to this, that's interested in symbol making or who has started symbol making, I assume you are the nerds that are watching this. Yeah. Uh, right. So we all start with thin black. I, I don't care. I'll, I'll tell secrets or whatever. Like, right. you, you know, if you start with, a thin blank, which is what we all start with because it's cheaper. Yep. Uh, and, and we all want to make thin jazzy symbols when we start. Yeah. Anyway. Yep. So, I mean, I, when I started, I was getting like 2,200 gram, 22 inch <laughs> blanks. That's really thin. Okay. Yeah. That's thin for a finished symbol. Right. You know, and it, it takes hours and hours and you got to let it rest and you got to let it, you know, and you yeah. destroy it and it sounds terrible. And, yeah. Uh, and, uh, it's because there's less material to move. Yeah. Uh, if, if, like I said before, if you're using cold, we're cold impact hardening metal, which means you have to compress this. I mean, you already know this Tim, but like you're, you're, you're compressing the metal with each strike. Yeah. So if you, if you, and where does it go when you, <laughs> when you hit it, it goes out, you know, out the that's, sides. Why the, that's why the symbol goes like this yeah. when you're hammering it. So, I mean, if you have a really thin symbol, there's nowhere for the material to go. If you have a thick piece of material, uh, and it doesn't have to be super thick, but like if you have a thicker piece of material, there's room for the material to move out. Yeah. So it takes less hammering to get the shape. And so what I like to do is, and sometimes I'll use thinner blanks because, because it gives you a certain attitude. It, it, all, it all depends on what you want to do. You don't use a wide angle lens if you're if you're going for a certain shot you don't use a macro lens if you're going for a certain shot yep picking what material and from what foundry and at what thickness is very important because you need to know that to get your end result yeah um so what i like to do is usually take a, a relatively like medium heavy uh blank and do the initial shaping and then you were talking about this with Dave. I watched your interview. It was very mm. good. Um, oh, thanks. And uh, uh, I also do the wipe phase. Yeah. Um, so I'll I'll wipe the I'll wipe it clean, 
and just turn it into a shiny blank again and then do a complete hammering again. Yeah. Um, because first off, then it gets past all the hammer marks, which means I have hardened that, that part. We can get past back into, uh, you know, the softer territory and then redo it. Yeah, because it's uh, a, there's a core there. Like when you're when you're compressing a thicker piece of metal, there's a core that is relatively unaffected as as it relates to the outer surface of the bronze, right. and and you're you're moving the core, but you're not like you're not like really hardening it to a to an intense degree. Right. You know, it's staying relatively soft, and then you, it's it's interesting. You said that it, right. you turn it into a blank again by shaving away that outer crust, but then that blank that, that blank is shaped. Right. But then you can continue shaping. So exactly. if I'm going for a certain profile and I feel like, oh, okay, I've hammered this enough that I'm comfortable with it. You can hammer it back to where, I mean, you can lay it back to where it's a little softer and then continue the shaping process. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, so you kind of take it in smaller chunks. So you, you might do your initial, your, your initial shaping might be a, a fairly low, would probably be a fairly low profile. Yeah. Go in and lathe. Then you raise that profile, go in and lathe, maybe go and raise it a little bit more if you're going for something yeah. higher. And you kind of, that idea, it takes a while, but that idea of like taking little chunks out of it. Cause mm -hmm. I, at the beginning, you, you always want to do everything at once or like do it, yeah. do a big batch of work. You know, the, the, the metal stops responding because you've been hitting it for two hours, but you're just going to keep going because you're like, it's not at the shape I want or it's got issues. Like that, that ability to kind of step away, you know, let it rest or take it to the lathe or, you know, put it aside is something that's also important to learn. Mm -hmm. um, that will save you a lot of uh, uh, wasted material, you know, destroyed material yeah. to, to do that. In a way, though, I would say that, that, that everybody should go through that because, yeah. because what's going to happen one day when you say, uh, when you've started to make symbols you're good enough at making symbols that they sound really clean yeah you know yeah. what happens when you you you've gotten to a point like i've gotten to I, i'm not tooting my own horn here i'm just saying i've gotten to a point where i can make a very clean yeah. sounding symbol describe what you mean uh, by that like why why is clean the indicator of a level of skill i i don't say that that's a matter of skill i just mean uh, like when you first start you're hammering so much that everything's like uber complex Mm, yeah, I, gotcha. I have, I have, I have the restraint, like, you know what I mean? When I yeah. said like, I have the restraint to make a symbol, you know, and I, I think you've said this too, like it's fairly straightforward to make a, a clean sounding symbol, yeah. but restraint is difficult, yeah. you know? Exactly. So, you know, once you're able to say like, here is this, this sounds good. It's very even sounding. There's no crazy tones going on. It sits flat. It's, you know, it, it's, it's got good stick. It's, you know, it's shimmery. It's got all the things that you want, you know, but, but it might lack some of the personality that, that you used to get back when you would just hammer yeah. your symbols to death. So it's good to go through that process because then you can pick and choose. You can say like, okay, you know what? I'm going to overdo this one, Yeah. you know, or yeah. like, because my, my philosophy these days is do less, you yeah. know, uh, and then you can add more because I can't take away a hammering. I can't take away lathing. Mm -hmm. You can't know. lower that profile back down after it's at a certain place. Exactly. Yeah. So, so knowing the restraint to get to get a, a core, and then you could do whatever you want to it. You know, then yeah. then you can make it gnarly. You can make it weird. You know, or it could stay clean. You're you're giving yourself options. It's it's yeah. you're giving you're you're setting yourself up at kind of a ground zero to where you just pick and choose where you want to go. I can't tell you how many symbols have uh, because of my lack of skill told me exactly what they were going to be and said, I can't be anything else but this. Right. And it was because, well, it meant not lack of skill, but lack of intention or lack of uh, restraint. That was the word you used. Lack of restraint. You kind of just take it. And then at a certain point without that restraint, the symbol is going to decide for itself what it can be. And you're not going to have a choice in the matter. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cause you've worked it so much that it's just like, there's no room left in the blank. It's full. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, so, okay. So pressed bell or hand formed, what are your thoughts? Both man. Yeah. What are we doing? What are we doing? Right. You know, I mean, listen, are, do, do you play in a rock band? You don't want a hand formed bell. You don't. You, no, really don't. you want a real, you want to, you want a 4,000 gram blank 
and you want to leave that bell raw until the very last pass. Yeah. And then you're going to have all the power and clarity and, and, and high overtones and beautiful singing, you know, that you want, you know, yeah. you playing jazz. Uh, like there, if you want, uh, like in the, in the case of making repeatable stuff, I think, uh, pressed bells are definitely good for, in terms of production, uh, like lowering your production time because you can, uh, you know, you can manipulate the bells pretty easily through top and bottom yeah. hammering. Yeah. Um, but, but there is, you know, uh, like hand form bells have a vibe, uh, that are, that, that really helps bring the personality of the symbol Smith out. Mm. Um, like yeah. your, your bell is your bell. Yeah. Um, my bell is my bell, regardless of size or shape, you know, like the way you make a bell is going to be different than the way anybody else does it. Yeah. Like, are you, are you doing it completely on the anvil? Are you doing it with, do you have, do you have uh, some other pieces that you use to help? with that or anything like that, you know, like, what are you doing? You know, all that is going to affect it and your personalities and your hammer is, are going to affect that as well. So in terms of like an art piece, if you're a jazz player or, or a player that doesn't have to play too loud, I mean, of course I could always get a blank and make a heavy hand form bell, but like, it's yeah. almost like, what's the point? Yeah. But, yeah. but like, if you're a jazz guy and you really want like a super personal sounding instrument, yeah, I like hand form bells for that. Yeah. Um, especially if you're going to be one of those amazing customers, please give me more of those customers <laughs> that, that say, that say like, do your thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like then it's, so then rare, it's but... yeah. Then it's like, yeah. Okay. You get the whole thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, as long as you're, as long as you're aware, as long as you're aware when you're making a symbol with a hand form bell of the physical like effect of that, you know what I mean? Like you're, yeah. you're thinning that the metal out in the center of the symbol so like you have to order properly weighted blanks to accommodate for the fact that you're going to be like considerably like thinning and stretching the metal in a very yeah. vital part of the, of the piece. And you have to, you know, when you take the weight down, you, you have to think about that, you know, that's a, that is a real important point of uh, with hammering, there is an element of your, your, you know, we think the lathe is where we thin the symbol out, but hammering is, is in a sense thinning it, not in a sense, literally it's thinning the metal because yeah. you're, you're compressing it and pushing it out and compressing it and pushing it out. And at a certain point, you know, so especially with yeah. hand form bells and starting with a thin blank and a hand form bell, it's like you, you yeah. have to be so intentional as to how you're going to do that. Um, I've cracked a couple bells well, actually only one bell, but essentially it was just, I, I was hammering the, the bejesus out of it and it was already a thin blank. And then I got to the lathe and started lathing through and it was like, I almost like lay through the entire thing, Yep. you know? So, but yeah, hand form, I, I, I go back and forth cause it's, I, I, any symbol Smith needs to think about their longevity doing it because it is incredibly taxing on the body. Um, more so than you think you kind of go, Oh, it'll be fine. Whatever. But it, it is like the amount of pain. I don't know if you ever, did you in the beginning just experience tons of pain until you built up enough muscle? Yeah. And I, I don't want to interrupt your story, but I can yeah. talk about that a little oh, yeah. bit. Go for like, it. Cause I, cause I started with steel. Okay. Yeah. And, and steel, I, have, I mean, I know that you do this stackering stuff. So, so you know a little bit about hammering steel yeah. and it's way it's, different. It's, it's gushy. Yeah. It, it doesn't, it doesn't bounce the way that, that bronze does. So all of the impact is going straight, <laughs> absorbing straight back up into your arm and neck and shoulder. Yeah. So like when I first started, I had, I, I, uh, I immediately had to seek some, some body work because I couldn't turn my neck anymore. Ooh, like yeah. it all, like all of it went in here and I didn't know how to stretch. I didn't know how to yeah. do anything, you know? So like, I, I really messed myself up pretty good. Now I just get sore. Yeah. You know, I have form now, so I just get really sore. Yep. Um, uh, you gotta take them breaks. Yeah. Gotta take breaks. Yeah. And I do, you know, I do acupuncture. I do, nice. I get, I get massages. I, I like to pretend and tell people that I stretch thoroughly. It's not true. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> ideally want to. <laughs> yes. I really want to stretch. <laughs> yeah. 
but yeah. instead I'm just going to have a cup of coffee and then right. start swinging a hammer immediately. Yeah. You know, immediately. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I do, I do some stretching and some, and some work and stuff like that. Um, and I try to stay hydrated and yeah. uh, not eat like crap. Uh, you know, the water so. thing is huge because the, the water drinking enough water is what is lubricating your joints, which the joints, I mean, my, my biggest problem is in my, hands and like the my the joints in my ring finger and yeah it just and that the water is going to lubricate it so those joints aren't just kind of grating against each other yep. and and causing wear and tear and trigger finger and all that kind of stuff that we have to deal with uh if we're not yeah. using proper technique so yeah um, and there's no way to learn proper technique because we're not and, yeah. you know like i got a little bit you know from you know yeah. i've worked with like I've worked with Nikki. I've been very fortunate. I, I did a little work with Nikki. I did work with Francisco, but like, I, you know, you mostly learn all that stuff on your own. And yeah. so it takes a while, you yeah. know? Um, yeah. and, and I don't know how, I, I actually don't know. How old are you? 32 next month. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'll be 39 in November. So we're not spring chickens. No, you know, no, no. like, uh, and it's, it's something that Bettis said when, uh, he did, he did a podcast that I listened to and he was talking about the power hammer and, and he was just like, he was like, listen, man, cause I think Bettis is in his fifties. Yeah. Like he, he's like all those guys in those videos in Turkey, they're all young guys, you know, yeah. the, the, you know, yeah. they, they, they burn them out and then move them on to the lathe or the, the logo room or whatever else it is that they're going to do. And, and then cycle you know, new ones. Yep. You know, I didn't even start until I was, you know, 35. Yeah. So <laughs> it's yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I, I told uh, Nikki this on his podcast. Uh, I'm, I'm having a, a power hammer designed and made right now. Yeah. And I am not going to be, I mean, maybe I, maybe there's a reason I should be a little bit more, have more discretion about this, but I kind of don't care. I just want to be like, Hey, look what I got. Look how, what, look what I'm going to use. Sure. Yeah. And listen, you will use it to whatever, and that that is necessary you right. may find that it doesn't work for everything you may find that it does work for some things right you may you may find that you know this is a good way for you to do series or this is yeah. a good way i think you said on that on nikki's podcast that you know you're like oh i'll start doing some of the stack rings you know stuff yeah. on there and see how it goes you know like uh, you know absolutely you know I, i'm not in a position where i'm ready for that like my I, 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 my shop is in a residential neighborhood. Mm, I don't yeah. think, uh, I don't think that I'm, I also don't really have the budget for it at the moment. Um, yeah. but, uh, like I have no problem with power hammers, uh, yeah. you know, I have no, I wouldn't care if, if you had it, like if you, if you said, if you decided, you know what, from now on, I make all my symbols start to finish with a power hammer Yeah. and, and you never swing a hammer yeah. at it that doesn't change the fact that you're a symbol smith or an artisan or anything right. like that. And that's you know? the thing, that's the thing that goes into like these little silly uh, marketing ploys that the industry has come up with to try and set their brand above the, the other ones. And, mm -hmm. and so much of it is bluster. And so much of it is just silly, honestly. And like the, the idea of yeah. like 100% hand hammer, like, and I get the idea of playing off of it's, it doesn't come from an assembly line. It comes from, an artisan, like yeah. obviously that's what, that's the point of marketing in that way. Yeah. Um, but I mean, we can sometimes sit at a, at an anvil for an hour, two hours, thousands of strikes just to get the baseline shape there before we really decide where we're going to take the symbol. Mm -hmm. And that is so hard on the body. And I want to be making symbols well into my late fifties, maybe even early, maybe even sixties, who knows? Yeah. You know, I probably, you know, I, I feel like when 70 hits that maybe, <laughs> maybe we'll be able to swing. Well, well let's, let's, I mean, like who can say, I mean, like the point, you know, there's going to be a few of us that eventually will have teams. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. I, 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 the money isn't there right now. You know, right. like I still, I right. still bartend on the weekends. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Like, and like you have a company that already existed before you started doing this. So like yeah. th there are other, like if you didn't have your other company, you would probably have a, a, a side gig. Oh, yeah. You know, like a couple totally. of us do it, full, you know, like Nikki, Nikki is, has been very successful. He's, he's just doing that, but he was working other jobs. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, totally. uh, 
like Dave just does the symbol thing, but like, there's not, not a lot of us that are just doing the symbol thing. Right. Uh, I, I, it is my full time thing. Like this is what I do most of the time, but unfortunately yeah. I also do like 30 hours a week behind a bar, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is very healthy and very good for my blood pressure. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, but eventually, you know, like yeah. this boom is happening. You know, that's why I'm trying to do this. You know, why I'm trying to have a website that says here are models that you can get. But yeah, but by all means, like, like challenge me, give me your, give me your weird stuff too. Um, because it's going to happen, you know, like yeah. at, at some point uh, it'll be, you know, and, and I'm hoping, you know, sooner than later, uh, you know, I'm not going to hold my breath, but I'm assuming that uh, with some hard work, I'll be, I'll be doing just symbols, uh, yeah. Sooner than later, the the question is: Will it get to a point where you have to have somebody else with you? Yeah. You know, where it just doesn't like, regardless of age, like when when do you when is it like I can't do this by myself anymore? Yeah, that's that's uh, this is a maybe a cool topic because I I feel like all of us have uh, or actually are maybe some of us are actually doing it. I think you're doing it right now, but the idea of having an apprentice. Yeah flirting with that idea. Okay. Get it, get someone in. It's not as simple as just hire someone because no. there's like a life commitment that has to be made yeah. in order to really do this. So it really is much more of a, an apprenticeship where you, you come and the idea would be you, you devote yourself to this craft Yeah, and you take years devoting yourself to it before. Yeah. And this, it is a weird, it's weird the way that works too, because I mean, you've met Trevor, my, my yeah. apprentice, my apprentice assistant. And like, he, he doesn't, he doesn't live close enough to me to work all the time. Yeah. And, and we actually don't work very often. Um, yeah. like I love Trevor, Trevor, Trevor has become a very good friend of mine. Um, Such a great guy, by the way. But I, but I, he's a great guy and a fucking amazing drummer. Unbelievable. And, and, yeah. And like, like so such good. a sweetheart, but we both have busy lives, you know? Yeah. And he's like over a decade younger than I am. Yeah. And he's doing like young guy things. And, yeah. and I am a crazy person that yeah. is doing like a really crazy thing and working all the time. Yeah. So like we, it's not like, like the apprenticeship is, it's not what, it's not what I would have wanted an apprenticeship to be, which is like, you're here all the time and you learn to do the thing, yeah. you know, but like, you yeah. can't expect somebody to do that because no. I, I can't, I pay Trevor when he does work for me, like, like we yeah. go do the trade show thing or he comes and helps do stuff at the shop sometimes. And like, I pay him for that, but yeah. I can't pay somebody to teach yeah. them how to do this. Right. And, and you're also stuck between a rock and a hard place because let's say, I do, let's say I do release these and then I blow up. Right. Like he's not ready to yeah. do the work, you know? Right. Uh, right. And, and so like, it would be a matter of like, I need you to come here and look and see what I'm doing so that you can, you know. Right. Uh, There's so much and, of an initial cost. You'd be sinking into it before you ever got to a point where you could see a return on that work. Yeah. You know, you, you, you'd have to really like really invest in someone. Um, and I, my, my plan, my hope is to use my companies as a way to get someone in. I'm paying them to do work that needs to be done, like shipping and, right. you know, hammering out these little stacks is the easiest thing in the world. It's like I, I, anyone could do it. Um, and assembling the stuff, all that, but then, and then use that as maybe a, a way to sort of like ease someone into a, but the, the I, I mean, I think it was, uh, I don't know if it was pa Picasso or Michelangelo, one of those famous painter artist guys used to use uh, interns to do like 90% of his paintings. And then he would come in and do the final 10%. <laughs> and it'd be a, you know, it'd be a, a Michelangelo painting or whatever, whoever the artist was, but I'm, you know, that's the idea, you know, as, as this explosion starts or this boom starts to really happen would be that you have people that can kind of do some of the more baseline work. Right. Um, but it's just, it is such a, it, seemingly insurmountable task to get to that point of like, you got to have someone extremely committed, willing to, willing to kind of put it all on the line and, and, and actually invest themselves, but you can't ask anyone to do that. You can't ask someone to come and like, Hey, get paid shit to do, you know, 
really grueling work that's very hard on your body. Right. And maybe one day, you know. Right. Yeah. It's just not. Yeah. Which is why you kind of have to wait until you're already so busy that you can't handle it. You yeah. know, because it's like, yeah. well, you know, I, I can sit here and not make money, you know, but like I can't have somebody else yeah. sit here and not make money, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah so that was uh, part of that was what, what I was going to ask you about. Like, where do you see your, do you just see yourself just making the symbols you love for the rest of your career? Or do you have like, I mean, obviously you've talked about the series and stuff, but what are your big goals and dreams for Mangiello symbols? What, what do you, what is the ideal? Not that there's a landing point. That's kind of a silly way to say it, but what is the, what's the pinnacle for you? What would that look like? Um, I, I, I try not to think about it that way. Uh, I mean, there's the real ultimate goal is that, I can own a nice little house somewhere it, it somewhere where it's peaceful and quiet and I can do my work uninterrupted. I, I can do the work that I want to do and people are excited to have that. Mm. Uh, I think that, and, and I can afford to be comfortable in that. I don't want to be rich. I'm just saying I, I can afford to be yeah. comfortable in my home and, and, provide for myself just by making the art that I, that I make. That's, that is, that's the, really the pinnacle. Yeah. I mean, obviously there's lots of pie in the sky stuff. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, I would love to, I'd love to have it be like wildly successful or something like that, but that's not realistic. Um, yeah. I, I think, I think realistic for me is, is that I get myself to a point uh, whether that's working on my own uh, you know, I mean like, dude, if, I'm telling you right now, if Zildjian parked a money truck in front of my house to like train a team and and actually start making handmade symbols under Zildjian, I'm in, dude. Yeah, like I'm in. Yeah, you know, you're you're just about the art form. It's about the yeah. art form, and so yeah, if, if, art, like the it, the integrity dies when you when when you go the way of uh like uh gimmick. And the way of uh, insincerity, mm. you know. So as long as you're sincere, it doesn't matter what you do. <laughs> like if you, if you, yeah. if you, if if tomorrow yeah. I went on Instagram and was like, "Hey, uh, li- listen, Zildjian offered me a bunch of money to to like train up a team of guys, and uh, you know they're the, you know they're doing a thing. Th- there's no loss of integrity there, you know. Yeah. Like right. So it, it's it's when yeah, that's yeah. how I feel about it. You know, I, I I like that that way of approaching it because obviously with the age of social media, we all uh, everyone has to have an opinion. It's like social media is like inviting every individual person to have a very strong opinion and and to shout what they hate about how the world works or what they hate about such and such a company or such and such a person. And um, I love that idea of just you can do what you want, you can say what you want. Just, just mean it, like really yeah. mean it, you know, like own it. Yeah. Um, and we, the, you know, we do see a lot of companies out there currently that are, that are just, that are not meaning it. It's just, it's very clear, see through that it's a, it's just a, a ploy, you know, the, the best instance is like companies selling blanks yeah, and charging 500 bucks for a blank that they mm-hmm. just literally smooth the edge out and they're shipping it out. Like, and sometimes don't dude, I I've had, I've talked to some people that said they sliced their hand really bad. I had to get uh, stitches. I had one guy was talking about, yeah, I had to get to go to the hospital to get stitches when I pulled that symbol yeah, out of the box. The, the, the Zildjian, the raw things, they, they come with a piece of paper that it says so that, so that they don't get sued. They're like, yeah, we didn't do anything to this. Be careful. It's sharp. <laughs> 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 Yikes. The worst is when you get new blanks in and obviously the edges are super rough, but sometimes you'll have just like a little splint thing uh-huh. sticking out where the, where the, where the bronze is just split a little bit. And there's just this little shard yep. and you just grab that thing and it just like totally slices you. So I've got, I've got all, so what I do is I get, I get all my blanks uh, delivered to my apartment. Okay. And then, and then I wash them at home and then yeah. I, I take them in batches over to, to the, uh, to the shop so that I don't just have piles and piles of them at the shop. 
And uh, so they're all lined up against the wall like, <laughs> like this. And uh, I almost took my toe off. Oh gosh. Like, like no. I like kicked, I like kicked one. It went oh. right. It like went right through my shoe into my toe. And I was just like, man, how lucky am I? I literally almost just, if it had been a slightly different angle or I hadn't been oh. wearing, uh, I could have just took my toe right off. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. You said that earlier about how, like when people ask you uh, about getting into it, you almost just like, uh, at least I, I, I tr- almost try to actively discourage Oh yeah, them from doing it, and and it's not like a it's in no means a like clear out competition or whatever kind no. of thing. It's, it's just it's a, dangerous. It's very dangerous, <laughs> I, dude. I I had one lathe uh, back when I didn't know like what I needed for a lathe. I just kind of was like, oh, I want a DC. I'm going to get a DC motor so that I can have like variable speed. So I bought mm-hmm. a DC motor and did not have the like it, it did not have like half the torque that I that was like the bare minimum requirement, right. you know, right, right. it just, you, you, you dig in a little bit and the whole thing goes, just stops. Yeah. 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 But something in the little um, controls thing fritzed out or whatever. And I flipped it on. It was like a fuse blue or something happened and I flipped it on and my buddy described it to me. It was like, well, this part blue, which essentially told the motor to go to infinite speed. And so I turned it on and it, it shot on so quick and I didn't have a, um, a chucked, uh, attachment for my backing, which majorly dumb, right? You got to have the little chuck key keyed chuck so that it doesn't like, so that thing can't spin off. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. And so it shot on so quickly that the lathe backing literally launched off of my, with the center bolt and everything launched off of the motor. And thankfully, you know, I have uh, this full bar all the way across attached into my, um, into my lathe stand, full on metal bar all the way across. And it just hit that thing, hit the ground and just shot across the, the shop and like nearly just destroyed my garage door. But it was like, that would have killed me. Oh yeah. Like literally impaled me in the stomach and I would have been like going to the hospital and just little things like that can happen. There's like infinite numbers of little. Oh yeah. There's so many, there's wrong. so many ways to kill yourself. I, uh, yeah, I've got a couple of really good scars. I hit myself with a, uh, with, uh, I was doing a, um, I don't have a drill press, so I, I do everything with a hand drill. Yeah. And, uh, and I had somebody that asked me for, you know, one of those stupid symbols with a bunch of holes in it. <laughs> oh, actually, you know what it was? It wasn't that I, I've done the symbols with the holes in them before. Uh, Trevor and I were, were cutting out a crack. Uh, mm. he, he and I were working on something and there was a crack and, and so I was going to drill a hole out of it. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the hole saw attachment is like a serrated, like, Ugh. you know, like death blade. Those with things a little, scare the w- w- Jesus out of me. And it's got a little pilot bit in yep. it, right? Keep it from getting so, out. So I'm putting the pilot bit in and there's a piece of wood under the piece to, you know, just like, you know, I'm, I'm being relatively safe. My hands, yeah. my other hands over here and the pilot bit went through the symbol and bucked on the wood and something happened. It like sucked me into it and pulled my one hand into my other hand oh. and just like went right into the side of my hand. Oh. And, uh, and I, I mean, it was, it was pretty gnarly. And uh, if we had gone like just a little bit further down dead, yeah, yeah I just would have like, yeah. and that wasn't even, that wasn't even a lathe or a hammering, you know right. what I mean? That was just like, right really what you're supposed to do with a piece like that is you're supposed to have a, dr- it should be on a drill press. Right. You know? And even on a drill yeah. press, it is super dangerous. Oh yeah. I actually stopped. Like, um, I heard a story. I know the guys over at dream symbols, Andy from dream. He, he talked about how they, he was working on a drill press and like, because a symbol is sh- is curved, you know, like the drill press, those serrated bits are flat, right? So you're hitting, mm-hmm. you hit, you come down on a symbol and you might come down on one side of the symbol and cut through it before you get cut through on the other side. And so what will happen then is it'll, it'll catch and then it can wrench something around and just spin something around like crazy. Yep. And so he was trying to cut a, a symbol jingle out using a hole saw on a drill press and it just caught the metal, swiped the metal around and like he he said it like almost took his finger clean off they had to go like surgically reattach it i just stopped using i i will not 
use a whole saw bit. So I tell people like the biggest hole I'll make is the one inch or like one and a half inch hole I can get with a step bit. Yeah. That's like the only thing I'll do mm-hmm. in relation to that. I've had a, in, in my hand here when I was building, when we were building my router table for the drums, I had a router blade go into my hand turned on, you know, like it was falling off of the, off of the table. And I, instead of running away, backing away, I just like try to grab it before it fell. And it just went like right into the hand. And they told me at the hospital, they're like any direction, anywhere else it would have hit a nerve and your function would not be what it should be. It was just yep. little things like we, obviously we could see or tell stories all day about that. But the point being that like, if someone cares enough, they will, you know, hopefully heed the advice, but also that won't be a deterrent to them. And if it is yeah. a deterrent to you, you probably shouldn't be a symbol smith. Yeah. You know, yeah. find something if else. You, if you like your life the way it is, do not become a symbol smith. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't do it. Don't do it. Because uh, everything about it will change. All of your personal relationships will be strained. Your, yeah. uh, you know, your, all your finances will be strained. Your body will be strained. Yeah, but that said, if you're willing to sacrifice literally everything, then it's very rewarding. It can be very rewarding. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> it, yeah, I, I, I'm like you in that. I just wake up thinking I'll, I'll fall asleep. I'll have dreams. I'll wake up thinking about some some technique or idea that I didn't that I had never pondered before. Like, oh, what yep. if I tried this in this sequence, and that could change it. Like, and theoretically, that could change it in this way. And and then it's like you go and you try it, and you go. That didn't work, but what if I change this element? And then it becomes this yep. never ending like trail of discovery mm-hmm. and exploration. And so it never, it's never boring. That's the positive aspect I would say to symbol smithing. Never, ever boring. Oh yeah. It's never boring. And even if you're doing the same thing a couple of times, like, like, let's say you got to make the same symbol a couple of times, like it's still just as challenging. Yeah. You know oh, yeah. what I mean? Whether, you know, it, like it's all, it's all challenging. Every single time you do it is challenging. Yeah. Uh, so, which is great, you know. Right. It's, it's almost it, meditative, you meditative, know. Yeah. There's such a level of commitment to every single symbol that it's it's kind of impossible to get into. Like with the stack ring stuff, there can be like with these little, um, I make these little stackers that go on a wooden base and I make these little stacks that kind of emulate a 808 clap sound like yeah. every company is doing. Um but, you know, it's easy to get into a zone and just kind of because they're easy to produce, you know, you can sit down, um, you know, anywhere from like 30 minutes to an hour, you can have a little batch of these steel pieces that you've done. But one symbol is you know, thousands of hammer strikes. And so, yeah. like, the idea of just kind of like cranking one out isn't really the, the idea of cranking a symbol out is like half a day. Is like cranking. Yeah, I mean, like, like, like with proper breaks, like stopping. Yeah. Every every like few rounds or whatever, you know, it like cranking a symbol out. It, it there's a lot of factors involved, but like, like let's say you got an 18 inch crash, right? Like I could probably crank an 18 inch crash out in like two and a half hours. Yeah. You know. And like, that's with like stopping so that I don't hurt myself. Right. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Like, and that's in, intensely focused work. Yeah. And that's not, that's not, I mean, like, I know some people will like do stuff in batches. I never, I always, I work on one symbol at a time. Okay. Yeah. 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 And I, 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 unless I'm doing something very specific, I almost never, uh, like, like certain kinds of symbols I'll have to come back to the next day or in a couple of days. I do almost all of my symbols in one shot. Okay. Nice. Yeah, all, almost all my symbols are done in one shot and 100% of my symbols are done one at a time. So you like to, you're the kind of person that just likes to tie everything up before you yeah. move on. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But sometimes depending on the type of symbol, the type of blank, like the, the desired outcome, sometimes you have to say to yourself, you have to get to point X or whatever, yeah. and you have to put it down and move on to something else. But until I get to that point, yeah. I'm not stopping. Yep. You know? Yeah, I hear that. Uh, I, I work totally differently. I work, I, I find those points. I definitely, you have to have those points because there's a very clear direction and stages in your mind that you have to keep, at least for me, I got to keep them 
in order, but I'll hit those points and then I'll try to do like five or six symbols at a time yeah. mm -hmm. getting to point A on shaping, initial shaping point A and do five. Yeah. Then they sit then I'll come back and maybe grab one. But what I find is that I tend to, I'll tend to get on one symbol and then I'll, after I've done initial work, I'll get on one symbol and maybe the intent was to do it in stages, but then I'll just kind of take that one symbol all the way. Yeah. Cause there's like, and a, I like, uh, I like them like, yeah, I like them to be able to grab you and just, and just do it. Now I might get to a point where, where I have to do them in sort of like batches where it's like, you know, okay, you do this part of the shaping for a bunch of symbols and let them sit down, especially when you have like a ton of blanks around cause you want them to be fresh as possible. But like, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I just like to sit down with it and be like, Hey, you and me, bud, like we're yeah. doing it. Let's go yeah. all the way. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> awesome. Well, dude, thank you so much for uh, this chat. This has been a good one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Obviously, we could probably talk for another four hours. Probably. Not run out of topics. Um, anything, so other than your series, anything exciting? Are you, are you like, what's the uh, rollout of that thing? Are you trying so, to do that this uh, year? Hopefully September. Um, yeah. Don't hold me to that. That's the hope is September. I've got a lot of symbols to make for it. And I scrapped one of them. Uh, like I had three series that I was doing. I scrapped one. I think I started with six and went down to three okay. and then went down to two because the one just wasn't, it just wasn't doing what I wanted it to do. Gotcha. Uh, and then I, I took on my first like artist, you know, and nice. Uh, uh, so Eric Binder, the, uh, yeah, uh, man. And, uh, so I'm and going I will to, say as, as for a first artist, you can't get much better than Eric. Yeah. And he's a super nice guy, you know, yeah. and, and, uh, he's a really great drummer and super knowledgeable. And, uh, I'm not into the whole like cloning case, yeah. thing, but he does happen to own a ton of them, uh, and has played hundreds and knows his history on them very well in terms of like, anatomy for uh, stamp type and and uh, like the lineage of it. So I'm going to go to Chicago uh, later this month to visit him and take a look at what he's got because that's the third series will be my interpretation of the vintage style thing. So uh, how did that, how did that relationship, I know we were trying to wrap up, but how, how did that relationship uh, formulate? Like what? So what was I, like? out of the blue, I, I had a piece that I thought hit a lot of, uh, the old K vibes, like, like it certainly wasn't, that wasn't my intention, but the vintage style thing where there's, you know, certain attributes are there in terms of, uh, the way it's laid, uh, the way yeah. a patina is applied, the way, uh, the way the taper is, you know, very little taper, just, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. And I, I really liked where it was. And I, I just emailed him and, or messaged him on Instagram. I was like, Hey dude, I, do you mind if I just send you this thing and you take a look at it? You know, like I, I wasn't asking him to endorse or anything like that. I was just like, can, can I ask your opinion Yeah. about this? And he was like, he was like, yeah, sure. So I sent it to him and he was like, dude, can I, can I call you? You know? And like, we, we had a phone call and he's like, I don't know what you're doing, man, but like, I've, I've seen, I've seen a lot of attempts at this sort of thing. And you, you're, I don't know what you're doing, but the vibe is there. And uh, I want to, I want to, you know, work with you. So, yeah. so I was like, yeah, man. So we just like talked about a bunch of stuff and talked about what, what we could do for each other and, and uh, sort of decided that we wanted to work on uh, like doing my version of, of the symbols that he loves so much and yeah. that, a, that a lot of drummers love and without me sitting here and being like, you know, this is an okay clone. Yeah. Just sitting there and being able to say, like, I sat in a room with a bunch of old Ks. I took the attributes of them that I that I enjoyed and yeah. made a couple of models that I that I think kind of nail that vibe. And here you go. You know? Yep. So man, so I love that I'm the same way as you. I cannot stand the the clone thing. I I want I want nothing to do with it. That being said, the idea of someone that that's like that approaching these symbols, taking inspiration from them and capturing the vibe is, I think where, I mean, I think that'll probably be super successful. I would imagine. Um, 
I think that's the way to go about it with that kind of stuff. Is, is think of it like the sound. Take into account the age and like how can you make mm-hmm. something new have characteristics that are almost pre-aged, you know, like they've, they've been sitting yeah. around for 60 years. And- yeah. And it's a, it's a combination of, of like simulating the brittleness of old, of old bronze, uh, yeah. getting your, you know, like I, I think some of it has to do with the kind of patina I use. I use like a very like natural patina. I know a lot of guys use, um, uh, like, I use chemicals. liver of sulfur. Yeah, liver of sulfur. A lot of yeah. like guys use yeah. liver of sulfur um, or ammonia or something like that. And I I I use um, I use salt, lemon, uh, yeah. uh, vinegar, and a ton of black tea. Yeah. Um, and it just makes a sludge. And you, I put it on the symbol, and uh, I put it on on the leaves, so it goes on even. And I let it go for two to four days. And when it's the color that I want, I wash it off and it, it looks like you brought it to a jazz club for 50 years, you know? Yeah. yeah. So like trying to nail that sort of stuff. Uh, I, I mean, I like the liver of sulfur stuff too. I think it's a really cool look. I was trying to just go for something a little grittier, something a little more yeah. like unpredictably aged, you know? I don't, uh, I'm not a huge, I'm not a huge fan of the liver of sulfur actually. I mean, I, really? I, I, I use it, um, I just find that it's not, it doesn't give me enough of a sound difference. Mm. It, it's like, a, it feels like just an aesthetic thing, but yeah. you know, it is, it, it, it does offer a little bit of sound. Um, what's the word change enhancement, whatever you want to say. But um, the idea of a patina, I, I think of like something thick on there, you know, that's yeah. like, that it's like, it's on top, just like, Patina from an old symbol mm-hmm. is literally grime. That's built. Yeah. It's, a, it's a layer of grime. That's why. That's why I like using what I use. Is just because it it literally builds oxidation like a layer of oxidation on top of the symbol, and then yeah. and then I, I you know it's all green and gnarly, and and then you you know you take it over to a sink and wash that top part off, and you've got this you know like deep patina that's literally is a crust on top of it. And that, you know, you know, shaves a bit off of your high end zing and, and, you know, adds to the, you know, the, uh, uh, that sort of perceived, uh, uh, over hardening, uh, of tough time and everything like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That, and just taking it into account, like how thick is the bell? Like we talked about before, how thick is the bell? Cause if I'm going to do that sort of thing, they have to be hand formed bells depending yeah. on which stamp you're looking at. And, right. you know, uh, you know, we talked a lot about the ring around the bell, yeah. which because of the way that they were made is, is in a lot of ways thicker, uh, yeah. than, than the bell. Uh, but then, you know, not a lot of taper going on around the body and, you know, like way tighter than you would expect, uh, you know, like a thin symbol to be, yeah. And you know that that sort of thing, like taking those things into account, and not just making like a a wobbly hand hammered symbol with a patina on it, and and being calling like, it an okay, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> calling it an okay club. Because and, and you know that's that's what happens. I mean, again, no offense to uh, any customers or or drummers or anything like that, but ninety percent of you, every time you see a hand hammered symbol for the first time, you say that's just like an old K. <laughs> yeah, you know, and uh, yeah. you know, so. I say it's like uh, it's like saying uh, I only like old cars. Right. It's like, well, what kind of old car? Or like, what is right. what the, what is the state that it's in? Like, there's so many other factors about an old car. Like, you could be talking mm-hmm. about uh, I don't know, '67 Chevy, or you could be talking about I don't know. Is that a, is that a, I'm not a car person. I just pulled that out. I, of my I, I don't know. I mean, it sounds like. <laughs> Trevor's a big car person. He'll okay, watch cool. this and he'll, so he'll, anyone, he'll let us know. Anyone who watches but, this, yeah. It's, it's, is a 67 Chevy an, uh, an a desirable car? We, we don't know. Comment <laughs> below. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> that or like something that's literally like a rusted out hunk of metal that's been outside for 50 years and it's right. a L, you know? Right. They're, they're both yeah. old cars. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, and, it, you know, and you're absolutely right. It's the same thing with the symbols. Like you, you get a 67K, yeah. uh, you know, but is it a nice one? Right. Yeah. You know, cause man, there are some bad old K's out There's there. There's some dogs out there for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then I, I don't know. I, I, I tend to think too, that like, uh, 
the age factor plays a much bigger role than people people want to admit. They kind of just think, oh, it's an old symbol and it has it sounded like that 50 years. It did not sound like that 50 years ago. Right. What what did these old K's sound like in the 50s and 60s? I mean, right. And then it's like, well, you can go back to the recordings of that age. It's like, well, recording equipment, uh, where were the mics? Right. Like, or the drummers that? or the room yeah. or the sticks or it's, anything, you know? It's just like an infinitely complex yeah. issue to try to like oversimplify. No, no um, one has bit on this yet, but you know, of course, of course everybody wants the Nefertiti ride. Yeah. So like, like no one has bit on this idea. Almost got one guy to bite on it. And, and I think we just decided that, uh, cause I made, I made this symbol that was sort of based on the idea of a Tony Williams symbol. I didn't go for, I wasn't trying to replicate a shape or anything. I was going for a vibe and we, we got the vibe we were going for. So we didn't do what, what my plan was, but like every time somebody says Tony Williams to me, I'm like, okay, so you want Nefertiti ride, which you don't know what you're talking about, but okay. Yeah. And then my answer is always cool. Well, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to make a vintage build symbol and then I'm going to cut a big chunk out of the side of it. That's if I ever make a Tony Williams symbol, yep. I'm going to cut a fucking chunk right out of the side of the symbol. Right. Because that's what the Nefertiti ride was. It was yeah. a broken K. <laughs> it was, it had a crack out of the side of it. Yeah. It was cut <laughs> out. Yep. And that's, and that's, that's how it is. It'll look like that symbol that, that Antonio Sanchez has, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. that's it. Like that's, if anybody ever asked me to do a Tony Williams thing, that's what it is. I'll make yeah. you a beautiful old K style symbol and I'll just, I'll just, just break it. it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just, just break it. Get it with a sledgeha sledgehammer, crack it, repair the crack. And then, yeah. And, and there you go. Yeah. That'll be $700, please. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> seriously. Yeah. The thing I've been, I've been really on this kick cause I I'm kind of, I'm finally coming out of that zone. I play a lot of music that really is served well with thinner symbols. Yeah. Um, I have in the past and I kind of, my lack of skill as a drummer, I made up for it by just being able to play quiet and play dynamic. And so I got called for gigs and stuff because I would be the guy that would show up and play to the room appropriately. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, was like a lot of guys where it's like, you start making symbols, you just make thin jazzy symbols, but that was also what I was actually playing. Um, but I'm finally coming to a place of realizing the beauty of like a medium weight symbol. Oh yeah. And just getting to that point of like, even if you're going to go really tall with a profile, it say it's a 22 inch and you know, like aim for 2,600 grams, 2,500 grams. Mm -hmm. And that zone is like, can be this like magic thing, but you got to realize that when you're going to sit behind it, if you're a guy that's like, I only play thin symbols, you're going to sit behind it and you go, ah, oh, it's too loud. Right. Take that. But you're to not going to realize. Yeah. yeah. Take that to your gig where it's outside. Right. And, and play that symbol outside at your gig or take it inside uh, at, a, at a kind of a, a dry room bar, play that, or even in a loud room and just play it quietly mm -hmm. and then have people give you feedback as to how it sounds or better yet, get a drummer to play it and you sit out front and listen sure. to it. Um, the symbols that I, right. it's almost like you have to train people <clears throat> to not pay attention to what they hear behind the kit. Yeah. You almost like you have to, and this is, you know, not everybody's going to want to do this, but like for people, for drummers, I think that want to be at a high level performing or, or in the way that they craft their sound. Think about how something sounds in front of it. Think about how the symbol is going to sound translated through mics Mm -hmm. or you know 30 feet in front when you're like think about the audience like isn't that why we play live shows is for people you know like yep. so it's almost like there's a there's a way of ignoring what you hear behind the kit in, in lieu of like it, thinking about well this is going to translate the way it needs to out front yeah i agree and that's our job is to yeah be able to produce an instrument that is going to translate acoustically well to to an audience but as an instrument, as a canvas, it's going to be pleasing to the, to the end user. Yes. You know, so that you're getting that mojo as a player. Right. But, but the tool is appropriate for, for the job that you're doing. You know, right. it'd be yeah. so easy for us to make uh, symbols. If it was really as simple as like, or the whole like dry 
slash washy slash complex slash all the things that like are buzzwords that people like. It'd be so easy if at the end of the day that that person's going to sit behind the symbol and play it really quietly. Yeah. You no. Know? And then they're going to go, wow, this is the greatest symbol ever. Mm-hmm. Well, what happens if you need to dig into it a little bit? Like what's yeah. it going to do when it's played loud? Yeah, and it just sounds like a, like a, like a TV playing static, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just like a, a, a low rumble with zero articulation. Yep. And that's what's, that is what's going to end up being the more, uh, I, I think a lot about like, what's this, what is a, like, I, I like to think about, I'm, I'm playing the long game. So I, I'm not trying to do what's expedient in the short term because I want to mm-hmm. be one of the guys that at the end of the day, that is like, like we said earlier, like we want to be the guys that are set apart. Yeah. You know, like um, it's not, a, it is an ego thing, but it's also for me, it's like, I just want to be as good as I can be. I'm not trying sure. to be better than Mangiello or Betty, better than Nikki moon or Con- Collingwood or Funch or whoever. I'm not right. trying to be better than them. I just want to be the best version of myself. Right. I want to be, with you guys. Yes. I, I want, I want, I want the group on the top. I want right. to be on the top. I want to be with that group. I don't want to be. Yeah. yeah. And, and we get camaraderie <clears throat> out of it. Obviously we get like a um, sense of community out of it. Uh, but anyway, all that to say, I think that the, the long game oftentimes, you know, I, I think about it. some people might be really successful only doing the tribute thing. Maybe. But yeah. I think it cuts against uh, it cuts against their better so their self interest their better uh, interest as an artist because yeah. the focus is on what they're cloning it's not on them as a maker you know right. like uh, I made a, a video on YouTube called the Bill Stewart Ride Sound because I put Bill Stewart's name that video did every did way better than anything I've ever produced and and I had that real world realization of, Oh, I could just do this over and over and over again and sure. make a name for myself. Mm-hmm. The Brian blade, uh, symbol sound, the right, right. Tony Williams, the, this, and you know, whatever I could, I could make a name for myself, but I am, am I actually building something or am I just kind of sure. like riding a coattail of, uh, riding the coattail of this like mystical thing or this, you know, over marketed thing. So it's like, I almost feel like the quieter way like the, that I see, like we're going about it, where it's like, you're building series, you know, it's, you're just, it's kind of like just putting in the work, putting it out there. You make the connections, like with an Eric binder, you make whatever, you make those little connections every now and then. But the whole thing is like, I'm just putting in the work little by little. I think that's, what's going to, at the end of the day, be like the, those are, we are, that's the method to really get us at that level, I think. Yeah. Because before we know it, we, we do this for, we've been in the game for 10 years. We've been in the game for 15 years. Like I had a buddy that told me one time, he goes, uh, do you want to succeed in your industry? I'll tell you exactly how to succeed. Do it for a decade. Yeah. And like, don't really, go away. Never go away. Just don't go away. And then yeah. uh, the more I've thought about it over the years, I'm like, wow, that really is. Cause I'm coming up on a decade of making instruments, uh, drums and percussion accessories and cymbals is in there. And like it, I'm just now to the point where it's like, I, I I'm, I'm recognized, you know, it like took yeah. years of no one caring, no one giving me the attention, no one buying my stuff, you know, people kind of going, Oh, Tim's making drums. You know, it, it yeah. took years of that. And it's just that consistent, like putting in the work, knowing that at the end of the day, it might not even work out. <laughs> you know? Yep. Um, but anyway, that, I don't know where I got off on that trail. That's um, that's I just have I a think, lot of I think thoughts. It was just about just about uh, just about sort of like going about it like authentically. I think yeah. that's kind of uh, kind of where you were going, you know. Yeah, and, uh, and to bring it back around to what we, you were saying, like the the authentic the authenticity of someone like yourself approaching someone who has a collection of these rare instruments. I mean that that's a dream. Like throw throw aside all of the bluster about it and just the idea of you getting to put your hands on some of the best old K's from a collector who has been collecting them for a while Mm -hmm. and knows what he's talking about. That's a dream for someone with that artistic integrity that is going to be able to approach that and go, wow, what inspiration can I take from these instruments? Right. Create something. 
Yeah. Um, I like Cause that. Because at the, at the end of the day, I mean, you're saying like, oh, you know, it might be difficult for somebody to do just the tribute thing or, you know, it, it might be difficult for somebody to do just custom one-offs. It might be difficult for somebody to do just series or something like that. You know, I the way I'm looking at the series thing is like, it's like making beer, you know, like, like this is the IPA, this is the lager, this is yeah. the, you know, but like, you got to know the style to, to do it. You know what I mean? And right. to do your version of it, you know? Right. Yeah. So the, the flavor, the, the sonic profile, it's not the old K ness. It's like, what is the old K saying? Right. It's that. How do I get, how do I get your stick to bounce off like that? How do I get, how do I get it to, how do I get it to wobble that way? How do I get it to, you know, and there's, there's, it's, it's knowing the anatomy. It's, right. it's knowing, the, knowing the ingredients. Right. You yeah. Know? Dig it. So. Well, Mike, thank you, man. Absolutely, dude. I appreciate you yeah. being on, and um, I'm going to try to get this thing edited quick so we can get it up. Because I'm trying to get in a roll with these things and just do these podcasts. Like, um, yeah, just actually like commit to doing them more and having these conversations more. But I, I really appreciate you being on. Yeah, of course. And you know what? If uh, you know, we could talk about this after. After I know we're we're already at like two hours almost. Dang. Uh, but like. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, we could talk about this after we get off the air here, but like, yeah. if you, I mean, if you want to talk about doing a thing or a segment or a, like a, if you want to get like super nerdy and technical, man, like, yes. let's, let's do it. You know, we could do uh, you want to hit, like, maybe we could hit a little topic. I could get, get some clips of like really technical stuff. I, here's one. We'll see how this goes. And maybe this could be like the format. I have been loving the idea of hand or loving the practice of, Forming a, a bell, because you, when you start hand forming bells, you just form it, then you form the rest of the symbol. But yeah. the idea of taking the bell in stage, in stages, and the body in spa, in stages, and kind of building up both at the same time, um, and almost like coming in at the end, and like building the bell out bigger so that it almost pulls the the tension tight, so you can almost build in a little bit of looseness around your bell. Mm -hmm. And then the final step is you go in and just like a real strong ring, almost like hooking that bell up and almost just pulling the whole thing tight. And I'm getting these. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And this, the idea of like, because you, it's very easy to over hammer the area near the bell on the top to where you mm -hmm. almost invite this sink. Yeah. And you invite that kind of wobbly gongy looseness. Mm hmm. To it. So techniques for being able to create a tight symbol and like you said, use uh, discretion and not use restraint. But that, yeah. that being one idea that I've, or one uh, technique I've been playing around with and I get good results almost every time. Yeah. I That's mean, I, I mean, we, we could definitely talk for at least two hours just about approaching that center. The center how are you yeah. approaching those? How are you, how are you approaching the sink? How are you approaching the bell? Are you using a pressed bell? Are you using a hand form bell? I don't know if there's, if there's an audience for that sort of thing, yeah. like, like I would definitely nerd out on like super yeah. specific stuff. Totally. Let's, let's yeah. figure out a, another time to hop on and we can maybe even like grab a couple of specific questions Yeah. and do that. that Cause that'd be awesome. Um, I literally, I had this set of hi hats back here that are, uh, they just have this really deep, ugly ass pit. So I, I got them to send me a new blank. It was like almost all the way through it. So I was like, I'll just make this into like a tall profile hi hat, which is like not what you make. You know, it's like right. tall profile hats are the devil. Uh, but I've actually landed a, a vibe with a couple of them. Um, so I, I was trying to do the same thing and it was just kind of always a little odd. And then this morning I just kind of went in and just like <laughs> hooked the bell a little bit and it just went, choom, the whole thing went, and well, obviously we'll tell after it has a couple of days to rest, but I was just playing it right before we got on. Like, oh man, there's so many like little things that if you just know what to do when it's in the right instance, it can just tie everything together. And it's a very, it could be a simple thing that's not time consuming or extreme in any way, but it can have Absolutely. Like extreme results. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, Thank I don't you. know. I mean, every time we say something, we could just keep going and going and going. Yeah, so. I know. I know. Yeah, right <laughs> this has been the Reverie Podcast with Mike Mangiello. Thank you for listening. <laughs>